Nikita, thank you so much for joining us up here today. And why don't we kick it off? I mean, introduce yourself. What are you up to and where are you from? Yeah, my name is Nikita Alexandrov. I'm the founder and CTO here at Think Myco. Um, I come from a bit of a technology entrepreneurship background. I'm a chemist. I study mycology under the famous Dr. Kathy Lawrence and uh, worked in biotechnology, pharma, and other areas that are kind of relevant. And, um, and, when, and you're the founder of Think Myco. And what's the, what's the high level summary? What is Think Myco trying to do? Yeah, it's pretty intricate what we're doing. And uh, I am a founder, but we have an amazing team of founders who kind of all came together from other industries as a whole to make a, a giant bet on mushrooms. So what we do is we have ve three very specific verticals. And uh, between those three verticals, we think we can capitalize on something that looks like a half trillion dollar market in the next 10 years. So it's a, a bit intricate, but I'll go over it. The, uh, the first vertical we're looking at, and we've developed some great technology there, is mushroom production technology. Um, we have some technology that came out of fundamental advances in uh, physics I've been working on for the last 10 years. And uh, that really changed a lot of things because it drops the costs of mushroom production to the point where on a gram for gram and dollar for dollar basis, mushrooms become competitive with meat as a protein source. That's so critical because a study out of Cambridge uh, this year, 30 scientists, the biggest food security report in the world uh, stated we have to uh, uh, increase crop yield 70% by 2050 or humanity becomes unsustainable. So it's more important than climate change or it's, uh, it's more urgent than climate change. So really excited about that. And the way we're going to leverage that to market is through a unique kind of franchise hub and spoke model where we uh, actually small farmers and local businesses take about 80% of the profits, but we service so many of those. Uh, we do very, very well by uh, doing good. Um, so the next thing we do that feeds into that is a functional foods line of mushroom jerky, which is a, kind of a meat replacement product that will leverage our low cost production to be hyper competitive. We're really excited about lion's mane as a food source because lion's mane has some neurogenic properties. It releases uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factors in the brain, which pharma has been trying to do for 20 years unsuccessfully. Um, this is one of the few compounds that you can take, has no side effects, and it's like steroids for the brain, and it can help with Alzheimer's, cognitive enhancement, neurodegeneration, super exciting stuff. And that leads to the last thing we're doing, which is uh, neurogenic drug development. So neurogenics as a field encompasses the uh, you know, $80 billion pharm uh, healthcare pharma uh, mental health pharmaceutical industry. It probably, from what we've seen here with the work on psychedelics, encompasses the $120 billion minimum therapy industry, um, about a $50, $60, $70 $70 billion neurogeneration, neurovascular disease industry, and cognitive enhancement, which is about uh, $5 billion, $4 billion, but growing rapidly. So we have a great team that uh, has a track record. You know, our team is one of the only people that have taken uh, neurogenic technologies all the way from R&D to clinicals, financing, um, IPO, and then NASDAQ. So I believe we have the only neurogenic technology um, on the market from some of the past work my team has done. So we're, we're really excited about this. It sounds like we're doing a lot, but uh, we're positioning ourselves correctly. We're executing well and uh, super excited. Yeah, that's a pretty diverse yeah. uh, spectrum of products. But where, so, so between those three, and let's call it, uh, could I call it psilocybin development and production? So you're looking at controlling the supply. And tell me a little bit more about, about how and where and when this can and will occur. Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting question. Um, a lot of people look at this in a cannabis mentality and, you know, they want to control the supply, they want to move things around, they want to flip nickels into dollars. We don't really see the economics and mass production of um, psilocybin. You know, Compass is doing great work there, but it's immediately commoditized. I mean, it's pennies uh, a dose and um, it's not an area where small companies, fast-growing companies should really be innovating. Um, the area we see for massive innovation is in terms of uh, bioprospecting, looking at all these compounds, learning from the psychedelics, learning from the brain, and making third generation compounds. So we do have technology around biosynthetic mass production of these compounds, could highly I, scalable synthesis. Could you maybe explain what a third generation compound is for 
Yeah, yeah, so the first generation is what we're seeing now. It's kind of uh, m magic mushrooms and it's GMP psilocybin like Compass has. So uh, we finished our R&D program on second generation therapeutics, which is things like um, psilocybin-based compounds with molecular modifications, new delivery systems, um, things that leverage the entourage effect that utilize psilocin, baocysteine, all of the complex tryptamines to... Um, be more effective, which we've seen in animal models. So we finished our work there and working toward preclinicals and uh, moving to third generations, which is compounds where we take what we've learned about the brain, we've learned from ibogaine and um, psilocybin, all these psychedelics, and we're making compounds that look nothing like these. They're unregulated. They're going to be the uh, pharmaceuticals of the future. Okay. Now your background is is both technology as an entrepreneur and cannabis. Is that right? We've done some R&D and uh, IP development in the cannabis space, but more from a kind of hard science, fundamental physics, um, critical technologies and biotech side. So I'm a lot more blue chip science based um, than, you know, maybe the cannabis industry. There's already a million times better science around these neurogenic psychedelics than there ever has been around cannabis. Okay. Now, Obviously, there's a, there's a surge of interest. We're talking about this at our show. There's a surge of capital flowing this direction. Um, you're hard at work. What are the, the, what's the low-hanging fruit in terms of indications um, that could, could um, legitimize this industry? Yeah, that's a really good question. So in terms of the indications, we kind of have to stop thinking about this in terms of individual indications. You know, we're not treating anxiety, depression, addiction, OCD. Um, you know, we're treating the root causes and what we're learning from the work at Johns Hopkins and a lot of these other groups show that this is a bit of a magic bullet that can cut across all those areas and, and develop this huge $300 billion neurogenics industry which uh, is growing rapidly and, um, you know, that involves cognitive enhancement and uh, very forward-looking stuff so we can, we can heal the sick and make the well better in a way, if that makes sense. And does the rapid movement occurring in the industry right now encourage you and inspire you, or does it also raise some red flags? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of interest and hype, and uh, that's great because this field's getting supported. All these great groups are doing research, and people keep coming up to me and saying, Nikita, um, this is going to be the next cannabis rush. You guys are going to be the next canopy. What they don't understand is, you know, this is already three times bigger than the cannabis market. You know, we're not going to be the, uh, the next canopy. We want to be the next Roche. Okay. Now, there's a variety of business models that are being executed right now. And, um, you know, some are proceeding with the more of a recreational approach. You're strictly medicinal focused. That's your focus. And are you, you're looking at uh, psychedelic therapies um, having removed the psychoactive compounds. Now, can you talk about the effectiveness of a psychedelic therapy without the transcendental state? Yeah, I mean, the transcendental state's important. A lot of people are going to get value from that, and there is huge value. But the reality is, if you want global market uptake, you can't be tripping for six hours. Um, and there's a huge clinical infrastructure w where people like Field Trip are setting that up. So our, our hypothesis has always been that drove our R&D program that these therapeutics have to be not microdoses, but, you know, sub or minimally perceptible doses. So we designed our therapeutic to be at a dose where you can go about your day. And, um, you know, a lot of people have different opinions, but DARPA just entered the field. This is the biggest advance in this field uh, to date, and nobody's talking about it. It happened two weeks ago. DARPA launched a Focus Pharma program, an enormous four-year program, an amazing team, and their remit is to bring a drug to market in four years for treating PTSD, and, um, but in a non-hallucinogenic way. So they're very excited about it, but they think, as we do, that for the general public, um, we're just going to be taking what we learn about the brain and making better stuff. So we're excited about all the hype and the cannabis guys rushing headfirst into this. But when DARPA and the U.S. Defense Department gets involved, um, that's a totally different animal, and that's really exciting for us. So obviously, moving forwards without, uh, without I guess, the psychedelic element of psychedelics gets you to commercialization faster, gets you in the hands of patients faster. Uh, so what do you say to people who claim it is the transcendental state, it's the change of state that causes the shift in emotion and affects depression, addiction, anxiety, etc.? So the transcendental state is very important from a higher cognitive function uh, perspective. 
if you want to start engineering the nervous system, you have to go a bit deeper and kind of blur that mind-body connection. So all the data we've seen, and there is a lot of data out there, shows that you can release neurotrophic factors in the brain without hallucinating. You can terminate cluster headaches um, without hallucinating. You know, our team's done work with uh, Ball 148, which is a brominated LSD derivative. We hold the IP there. And um, that seems to terminate cluster headaches with no psychoactive effect. We're seeing that with 18MC. It seems to have incredible efficacy in treating addiction with no traditional psychoactive effects. So it's two different worlds. You know, the recreational psychedelic market is going to be like maybe $20 billion. Um, but the neurogenics market as a whole is uh, $300 billion, And uh, that's what's exciting for us. And the science backs it all up. There will be a market of people that do want to hallucinate for you know, six hours a day on a therapist's couch, but uh, that's not what is really exciting us. So in your position with, with Think Michael right now, you can't only be an entrepreneur because you also have to be somewhat of an activist. And in addition to building Think Myco, you know, what, what is Think Myco doing aside from the development of, of specific compounds? What are you doing to move the needle on regulation? Yeah, so... Creating a sustainable business model, which is very blue chip, is how we increase adoption in education. You know, if we're trying to push magic mushrooms to the general population, that's going to take a lot of outreach. That's going to be very difficult. But with our kind of very traditional biotech and pharma approach, we're learning from everything everybody's doing, but uh, we're not hitting a lot of the same hurdles. Okay, now walk us through Think Myco in 2020, 2021. Yeah, so we've, um, we've done some, a lot of work in the last years. We capitalized, put some money to the company um, in the last quarter. We've created a facility here in South Vancouver, fought a lot of IP, created just a cutthroat technical team, um, a lot of uh, go-to-market strategies. We've been doing a lot of bioprospecting, which is really relevant for new drug discovery. Um, we're looking at fungi strains all over the world that are valuable for medicine. So we have one we found here. Um, it's got insane growth properties, which is great for us because if we can grow twice as much medicinal compounds per unit, it cuts our nutraceutical costs in half. We're looking at um, poisonous mushrooms that have targeted cardiac effects, which have never been seen before. We're looking at that for developing new cardiac drugs. There was an um, ex extremely rare fungi that only grew in a conflict region in Asia which I went and acquired, which was a, a long story, and that looks like it can flip over a uh, $1 billion fine chemicals industry. So we've been really pushing ahead with the small amount of work we've done, but we're recapitalizing um, in the next 60 days. We're gonna just hit everything hard. We're gonna um, pilot scale a lot of our technologies and um, add a lot of value. And have you isolated individual strains that you're gonna focus on as your priority? Absolutely. We, ha we have targets. Um, it's not all just bioprospecting. Um, we know exactly what we're looking for. But the cool thing about bioprospecting fungi is only 10% have been discovered. And of those 10%, it's hundreds of billions of dollars a year in terms of industry, pharmaceuticals, etc. We have some very hot leads and a great team. And uh, we're really excited about fungal biotechnology as a whole. And what are you looking for when you identify those strains? Because there's hundreds to choose from. Uh, I think I learned about another half dozen last night at dinner. Um, so, so what stands out to you? What, what makes a, a strain your favorite to work so on? So we've been speaking with Dennis a lot, and uh, his approach to bioprospecting is you take a look at what's happening in exotic regions with their traditional medicines, and um, those anecdotal things, especially in Chinese medicine, all of those can inform pharmaceutical development because something's happening there, it's just not well understood. So we're taking a look at all that. We've pretty much uh, wrapped our heads around that field. Now we're looking a bit further into uh, more advanced stuff. Got it, okay, now does Think Myco have a booth in the expo? Yeah, so we've got a booth here. The whole Think Myco team is around. Uh, we got a pitch deck on the website. It's, uh, it's a bit private, but I'll share it with you guys. Thinkmyco.com slash pitch. You guys can see what we're up to. Take a look at our next generation therapeutics. We've got a bit of a mock-up there. We have a full financial model, so you can see why we're justifying some very large economics. Thinkmyco.com slash pitch. That's it. And you guys, do you know your booth number on the show floor? I do not, but we're right around the corner. We're right around the corner. Okay. Awesome, Nikita, thank you so much for joining me. Guys, please give him a hand.
Yeah, this is really a pivotal moment for uh, the psychedelic therapeutics industry, and um, I'm so excited about what's about to happen in the next hour or two. This is game changing. We got to thank Jay for that. So another round of applause for Jay. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Yeah.